Hi folks, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech and in this video we're going to look at modeling mass spring systems. But our focus here isn't as much on modeling or generating the differential equations, but instead on what are the variables that we use to describe these blocks' motions. So here's our goal. We have a couple blocks connected by a spring K, and there's an external force applied to mass T. And what we want to do is create a differential equation model. That's kind of the big picture. So here's one of the first steps that most of you would have done if you've attacked this sort of problem before. You redraw the picture, maybe define some reference points for the blocks, in this case some red center of masses, and then you apply some variables of motion or generalized coordinates, whatever you'd like to call them. Here I've denoted those as x1 and x2, moving positive to the right. If you take a step back and look at this, there's a force applied to block 2, so it's certainly going to be moving to the right. And then block 1 is going to follow along for the ride. So you can imagine that these blocks are going to have some combined motion to the right and then some motion relative to them as they're vibrating. And one of the things that we're going to look at in this video is what exactly are x1 and x2? So the next step is to break out those blocks from their surroundings, the contact forces with the horizontal surface and the interaction spring force between them, labeling them with the x1 and x2 motions, and then start lathering them up with external forces and inertial forces. So the first thing we can do is put the inertial forces on, always in the opposite direction of our assumed positive displacement of x1 and x2. And the other, only other external force we have is the spring force between the two blocks, and so we put that on. Now we can also put in the vertical forces, and we're not going to be so much interested in that in this example. It would just tell us that the normal forces, the N1 and N2, are equal to the gravitational forces. Now let's use Newton's second law in the horizontal direction. And you just sum up all those forces set them equal to zero for the two blocks. Maybe rearrange them into a form that is nice, that you like, like this one, and voila, you're done. But what we're going to do is now look into what exactly are x1 and x2. To get at that, let's just review Newton's second law. So here's a coordinate frame, and here's a particle of mass m. It has some external forces applied to it, maybe a thrust force, a gravi gravitational force. There could be others, but that's all we have here. And the particle is scooting along some path with the dotted line. Now for Newton's second law, what we need to know is the absolute acceleration of that particle. So a lot of times what we do is create an absolute position vector to it from the origin of some inertial frame. Now we can write Newton's second law in vector form, and we're done. We just have to figure out what A is. Now let's go back to our two-block system. This is the same picture I had on the previous page, and now we're going to dig in to what exactly are x1 and x2. And to do that, I'm going to do something similar to what we did for our little particle up there. I'm just going to throw down an inertial coordinate frame. You can think of it as a wall over there on the left if you'd like. And let's also put in a couple other distances. So L1 is the initial location of that first block from the vertical wall. LUS is the unstretched spring length, the initial distance between M1 and M2, the two blocks. So imagine that you put these this block system down on the table and just let it sit there, reach equilibrium if in case you bumped it and it was jiggling a little bit, and, and this is what you end up with. You could measure with some device the distance of block one from the left wall and the distance between the two blocks. That's L1 and LUS. Now imagine these blocks in some other configuration, and I've drawn these orange lines on them that are moving along with the block, so it gives us a little reference point. And what we need for Newton's second law are the absolute accelerations of those two blocks. So just like in our particle example above, I'm going to draw a couple absolute position vectors from that vertical wall to each of the blocks. Now I could just use that P1 and P2 in Newton's second law, but instead let me also add into this mix X1 and X2, which are distances from the initial configuration, which again was in equilibrium, to each of those two blocks. 
And now I can just write out the expression for P1 and P2 in terms of our newly defined X1 and X2. And here they are. And notice that I've been very specific about showing what things are functions of time and what which things are not. And that's important because what we need for Newton's second law is absolute accelerations. So I need to take two derivatives of those puppies and when I do that all the constant quantities, the L1 and the LUS, go bye-bye. And so I just have P1 double dot is equal to X1 double dot and P2 double dot is equal to X2 double dot. So I really don't need to use P1 and P2 or I can just Think of it as the same thing as x1 and x2 from an acceleration standpoint. So in summary, x1 and x2 are defined as the motion relative to the static equilibrium configuration. That's really important because if you were doing analysis and you needed to know the absolute position of these two blocks, you could certainly use x1 and x2 in the equations that we derived on the previous page. But to write the absolute positions, you would need to add to those x1 and x2 quantities for all time, L1 and L1 plus LUS, respectively. So that's all for now. In some other videos, we go into more details of how to drive these equations for more complex systems. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.